Life isn't always a bed of roses, even with a robot. No arguments, perhaps. But sooner or later, the honeymoon is over. And there are all those little service problems that you'll have to cope with. Yep, weak batteries again. Are we stuck with the same old off-the-shelf batteries, or can we possibly build a better battery? In the earlier chapters, we considered some battery basic. Now let's learn how to design a supercell so that your robot can help you realize some of your wildest fantasies. We've seen that an electrochemical cell can be thought of as two half cells, in which the electrodes consist of different materials. At the anode, oxidation occurs. In this particular cell, zinc atoms lose electrons to become zinc ions. As electrons flow from the anode over to the cathode, their energy can be harnessed. At the cathode, reduction occurs. In this case, copper ions are reduced to metallic copper. A salt bridge connecting the two cells allows for ion movement from one half cell to the other. The secret to designing a more energetic cell lies not in a different process, but in the materials used. But how do we know which combination will give our robot that little something extra? The best measure of the output is the potential difference it produces. Potential difference is measured in volts. And it's a measure of the energy that each electron can deliver as it flows from the anode to the cathode. We know that chemists list metals in an order which indicates how readily they gain and lose electrons. Now, if we choose two metals in the series for our cell, how might we predict their potential difference? It's a bit like trying to measure the height of two children located in different parts of a room. One approach would be to select one child and assign it a value of zero. Other children could be compared to that child. A positive number would indicate how much taller a child was compared to the standard. A negative number would indicate a child smaller than the standard. At a glance, we could compare the height of any two children. Chemists use a similar procedure. As an electrochemical standard, they have selected a hydrogen half cell. The hydrogen gas at a pressure of one atmosphere is introduced into a tube. The tube is immersed in a standard concentration of hydrogen ions, one kilomole per cubic meter. The electrode is made of platinum because it is chemically inert and doesn't interfere with the reaction. At the electrode, hydrogen ions unite with electrons to form molecules of hydrogen. The tendency for an element to be reduced in this way is called its half-cell potential, represented like this. A half-cell potential of zero volts is assigned to hydrogen, the standard. Remember that no reaction occurs in this half-cell unless there is another half-cell. Take, for example, one in which a copper electrode is immersed in a solution containing a standard concentration of copper ions. A voltmeter connected to this cell will read 0.34 volts. Electrons flow from the hydrogen to the copper half cell, which means the copper ions have a greater attraction for electrons than hydrogen ions. We measure the greater attraction of this half cell reaction occurring in the copper half cell by comparing this voltage to the hydrogen standard. Simple to do, 
because the standard is zero. The half cell potential of the copper reaction is 0.34 volts, greater than the standard hydrogen. The gain of electrons makes this a reduction reaction. Since the complete reaction is a redox reaction, over in the other half cell, the hydrogen reaction must be an oxidation reaction. Hydrogen atoms must lose electrons to form hydrogen ions. But the equation we originally wrote in which hydrogen ions gain electrons to produce hydrogen is a reduction reaction. Since the reverse reaction is actually taking place, we must reverse the equation. The two half cell equations then correctly describe the reaction occurring in the cell. But as we choose different electrodes, things do not always work out the same way. Suppose we replace the copper half cell with a zinc electrode immersed in a solution containing a standard concentration of zinc ions. When a voltmeter is connected, it shows this reading. The needle swings to the left, which indicates that the electrons flow from the zinc half cell to the hydrogen half cell. This means that reduction is occurring in the hydrogen half cell. Hydrogen ions are gaining electrons and forming hydrogen atoms. In the zinc half cell, atoms are being oxidized to produce ions. Here's the oxidation equation and the half cell potential. Because chemists like to standardize, and since all reactions are reversible, they prefer to show half cell reactions as reduction reactions. Reversing the equation, we must also reverse the sign of the half cell potential. By comparing the hydrogen standard with many different substances, chemists have produced a table of reduction reactions and their half cell potentials. With this table, we can examine any two possible reactions, such as this familiar pair. Obviously, since batteries are all redox reactions, both of these reactions cannot be reduction reactions as shown. But which will it be? The higher half cell potential of copper compared to the zinc means that the copper ions will have a greater attraction for electrons than zinc ions. So the copper reaction will be a reduction reaction. And the zinc reaction must be reversed to become oxidation and the sign of its half cell potential must be reversed as well. It's easy to find the potential difference for the reaction by adding the two half cell potentials. By using a list of half cell potentials, we can compare any two half cells without actually having to construct a battery. With this background, you can set about designing a super duper cell for your extra special cellmate.